There is an infinite amount of cash at the Federal Reserve. There is an infinite amount of cash at the Federal Reserve. There is an infinite amount of cash at the Federal Reserve. Good morning, Bitcoin. Today is Thursday, March 4th, 2020, 2021. My name is Thomas Hunt, and here's what's happening today in Bitcoin. Bitcoin will eventually be a global currency and worth infinity, Kraken CEO says. Mulling Bitcoin and 100K? Is Grayscale's discount a buy signal? Why Bitcoin could triple over the next year. But first, the price of Bitcoin is down. Let's see. The price of Bitcoin is down 3.08% in the last 24 hours, with a last of 49,927, a high of 51,777, and a low of 48,599. That's $1 for 2,004 Satoshis just on the other side of the 2,000 Satoshi barrier. Volume was at 7,755 Satoshi Bitcoins changing hands. The market continues to lean long with 92% heading that direction. Bitcoin dominance is at 80%. That's 20 Satoshis for a penny. Bitcoin will eventually be a global currency and will replace the dollar and a $1 million price target within the 10, next 10 years is very reasonable, Kraken CEO says. Bitcoin is going to the moon, Mars, and eventually will be the world's currency, Jesse Powell says. I think a million dollars as a price target within the next 10 years is very reasonable. Bitcoin will eventually become the world's currency because you're going to, you have to think it's going to infinity. Jesse Powell, CEO of cryptocurrency trading exchange Kraken said in a Bloomberg interview Thursday, national currencies are already showing extreme signs of weakness and people will soon start measuring the price of things in terms of Bitcoin. He said, I think true believers will tell you it's going all the way to the moon, to Mars, and eventually it will be the world's currency. Kraken is talks in talks to raise new funding that would double its valuation to $10 billion, according to Bloomberg. In the near term, people see Bitcoin surpassing gold as a store of value. So I think a million dollars as a price target within the next 10 years is very reasonable. Jesse Powell said, Bitcoin believers expect it to replace fiat money and the market capitalization of all national currencies combined could make up its worth, according to Powell. Of course, mad Bitcoin's already predicted the price of Bitcoin going to infinity, as has as well as Adam Back and Max Kaiser. Adam Back saying on January 8th, BTC USD hits infinity and becomes the unit of account because USD ceases to exist. Mulling Bitcoin and 100K is Grayscale's discount a buy signal? In his latest crypto outlook, Bloomberg's Mike McGlone notes that the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust is now trading at a modest discount to its underlying Bitcoin holdings. As of a few weeks ago, the trust was selling at a whopping premium. If the past is prologue, suggests McGlone, that might mean a bottom in Bitcoin, which fell to around 43K last weekend from around 58K a few days earlier and is for currently at 49K. Cycles are always changing, though. Another possible reason for the evaporation of GBTC's premium, the launch of the Osprey Bitcoin Trust with fees far lower than the Grayscale product, not to mention a number of other vehicles in which investors who otherwise might not be able to buy Bitcoin directly can invest in the crypto. They also take a look at Bitcoin's famous high volatility. Comparing it to Amazon, he reminds him that Jeff Bezos' company was also wildly volatile in its early days. Checking the data now, 
he finds the 260-day risk measure on Bitcoin is about 60% versus Amazon's 40%. He suggests Bitcoin volatility could drop below Amazon's by 2022. I've already called Infinity. We will absorb all of the world's value. First, we will build the cart. Then, we will build the horse. Mad Bitcoins, October 20th, 2017. Why Bitcoin could triple over the next year. William Quigley, Managing Director of Magnetic, explains why he believes that Bitcoin's value can still dramatically rise into 2022. I've already called Infinity as the top. Too late. September 27th, 2017. Mad Bitcoins. Pay Bitcoin and Lightning Network invoices and turn something on. Introducing LN Trigger, an updated M5 Stack 121 with access point for easy setup. It runs on M5 Stack and LN Bits. Get the code at GitHub. Learn more on Arc BTC on Twitter, Ben Arc. More amazing devices from Ben. You can now use the Lightning Network to turn something on. Remember the $67 top prize from Mad Bitcoin's 2014 Comic Con Bitcoin Costume Contest? It's now worth $6,000. And it's unclaimed. If you wore an alien costume to the 2014 Comic Con Comic Fest in San Jose, you have an envelope somewhere, hopefully, in your house worth $6,000. Or you have a great story about someone gave you Bitcoin once and you threw it away. Learn more at the World Crypto Network. Marshall Long at OGBTC on Twitter was digging through some old photos from 2013. Check out his screenshot here of the Butterfly Labs Jalapeno Miner, a Bitcoin ASIC. Mining that Bitcoin. We've also got some cool screenshots from at Mad Bitcoins from April and May 2013. You can see the beginnings of the Mad Bitcoin show right here. An early screenshot shows you when it was just five episodes. You can also see this early screenshot where the price of Bitcoin fell from a high of 137 to a low of 104 to a last at the time of 116. <laughs> Those are the good old days. Here's a shot of Reddit slash R Bitcoin where you can see uh, the early Let's Talk Bitcoin episode number four submitted by gamer Andy himself and several mad Bitcoins episodes. One of them submitted by T Hunt himself. Pretty cool back in the day. And here's a screenshot of the mad Bitcoins YouTube page on mobile. Back when I had 49 subscribers, 1,446 video views, and 19 uploads. Mad Bitcoins joined YouTube April 19th, 2013. Fun stuff. Hey, we've reached our goal for the new laptop again. This is uh, going up and down here. Uh, you can donate with a QR code on your screen using on-chain Bitcoin, or you can donate now with the Lightning Network. Check it out. I've got my phone. It's over here. We're going to do another lightning demo. It's just that easy. This time, we'll even go ahead and buy some Satoshis in Strike. So here we are in the Strike app. Let's see. So here I am. I'm a Bitcoin user in the Strike app. That's great. I push the deposit button, and I say, I would like to deposit $5 into my account. Here it is. Deposit $5. All right. Push the deposit, it says from my debit card. All right, confirm. Deposit successful, $5 in my strike account. Now what I do is I go to my wallet of Satoshi. This is gonna be a three part transaction. So I'm gonna accept them here in my wallet of Satoshi. I'm gonna say receive custom amount $5. So here you go. I'm setting up the invoice in Wallet of Satoshi to receive $5. I'm going to tap the QR code to copy. 
going to go back to the strike app and I'm going to click pay. Now that I have $5, I'm going to pay. I click the QR code thing in the upper right hand corner and I paste in my address. It says strike pasted from wallet of Satoshi. It says it's $4.99 right now. Should I confirm? Confirm. So there it is. The $5 went from my debit card to my strike account. Now it's going from my strike account to my lightning wallet, wallet of Satoshi. Ding, wallet of Satoshi got 9,981 sats from uh, that address there that we just got. And now watch as the wallet of Satoshi is going to add those Satoshis to the fundraiser. I'm clicking $5 here. Looks like $5 might've gone up in that time. I'm scanning the QR code. So you can see the sats that I bought went from debit card $5, strike app $5, which again is still $5. It never became Bitcoin at that point. Then strike sent lightning payment to my wallet of Satoshi. And now wallet of Satoshi is sending it to Tallycoin. Paid. Done. It's just that easy to use the Lightning Network. Donate at Tallycoin. Get your app at Strike. Get wallet of Satoshi on the App Store. They're both on Android or Apple. Check out shop.worldcryptonetwork.com. You can get the Trezors Don't Float 2.0 t-shirt and the HAL Finney mug and t-shirt. I ordered mine. Can't wait to show that off. It's going to be great. Peter Brandt at Peter L. Brandt on Twitter says, Laser eyes. The single most bearish factor I am presently considering for Bitcoin. Unbridled enthusiasm plus FOMO buying and signals a deep and or long correction. Not only is it obnoxious, it is stupid. If you want the world to take Bitcoin seriously, then stop acting like children. Interesting commentary from Peter L. Brandt on Twitter. And where'd the other tweet go? Oh, the other tweet is gone, but there is a tweet here uh, saying that this is the most interesting article the person had read. It was from Arthur Van Pelt, and he was saying that perhaps Len Sassman could be Satoshi. Uh, let's read a little bit of the article by Leung on Medium. Len Sassman and Satoshi a cypherpunk history. We've lost far too many hackers to suicide. What if Satoshi was one of them? Embedded on every single node of the Bitcoin network is an obituary. Hacked into the transaction data, it's a memorial to Len Sassaman, a man essentially immortalized in the blockchain itself, a fitting tribute in more ways than one. It says Len Rabbi Sassaman. 1980 to 2011. Len was our friend, a brilliant soul, a brilliant mind, a kind soul, and a devious schemer. Len was a true cypherpunk, equal parts brilliant, irreverent, and idealistic. He devoted his life to defending personal freedoms through cryptography, working as a developer on PGP encryption and open source privacy technology, as well as an academic cryptographer researching P2P networks under blockchain inventor David Chom. Len was a pillar of the hacker community, a friend and influence to so many of the important figures in the history of InfoSec and cryptocurrency. Losing Satoshi, by all accounts, Len was on track to be one of the most important cryptographers of his time. But on July 3rd, 2011, he tragically took his own life at the age of 31, following a long battle with depression and functional neurological disorders. His death coincided with the disappearance of the world's most favorite, famous cypherpunk, Satoshi Nakamoto. Only two months before Len died, Satoshi sent their final communication. I've moved on to other things and probably won't be around in the future. After 169 code commits and 539 posts in the span of the year, Satoshi disappeared without explanation. 
They left behind a slew of uncompleted features, raging debates about their vision for Bitcoin, and a still untouched fortune in $64 billion in pre-mined coins. We've lost too many hackers to suicide. Aaron Schwartz, Gene Kahn, Ilva Zitzmrowski, James Dolan. All of them victims of a stigma and an epidemic that has exacted a price on technological progress itself. Imagine if the creator of Bitcoin died well before they could see it through. And if that were true, what would they have given the world had they been treated with the concern and dignity they deserved? I hesitate to speculate about Satoshi's identity given that the discourse has generally ranged from misguided to downright idiotic and unethical. But, with Craig Wright fraudulently claiming credit and invoking a copyright claim to take down the Bitcoin white paper, it's important we revisit the topic and recenter the discussion around the cypherpunks who actually built Bitcoin. Whoever Satoshi was, they were very much standing on the shoulders of giants. Bitcoin was the culmination of decades of accumulative, accumulated research and discourse within, within the cypherpunk community. In this sense, Len was unequivocally an indirect contributor, yet one has to wonder who actually wrote the code, ran the first node, mined the first coins, and posted using the Satoshi pseudonym. To, th to synthesize and implement the myriad ideas Bitcoin was based on, that person or group of people would have required a unique combination of expertise spanning public key infrastructure, academic cryptography, P2P network design, practical security architecture, and privacy technology. They would likely have been deeply ingrained in the cypherpunk community and adjacent to the figures who proved to be major influences on cryptocurrency. Finally, they would have needed the ideological conviction and hacker ethos to roll up their sleeves and anonymously build a real version of ideas that had previously been relegated to the realm of theory. When I consider Len's life, I see many of these same traits. I think there is a very real possibility that Len was a direct contributor to Bitcoin. In light of the unprecedented attention that cryptocurrency is receiving, I'm hopeful I can bring attention to one of the unsung heroes to whom we owe credit for it. I also hope that we can reflect on the immense importance of addressing mental illness and especially functional neurological disorders that deserve far more attention. Even in his youth, Len was a self-taught technologist who gravitated towards cryptography and protocol development. Despite living in a small town in Pennsylvania, by 18, Len was on the Internet Engineering Task Force and responsible for the TCP IP protocol underlying the Internet and later the Bitcoin network. Always kind of the odd kid because he was smart, Len was diagnosed with depression as a teenager. Unfortunately, he suffered traumatic experiences at the hands of borderline sadistic, sadistic psychiatric pr practitioners, experiences that would presumably leave one distrustful of purported authority figures. In 1999, Len moved to the Bay Area and quickly became a regular in the cypherpunk community. He moved in with Bram Cohen, creator of Mojo and BitTorrent, and was a contributor to the legendary cypherpunk mailing list where Satoshi first announced Bitcoin. Other hackers remember him as intelligent and lighthearted, chasing down a squirrel at a cypherpunk meeting and speeding around in a sports car with a get out of jail free card in case he was pulled over. In San Francisco, Len devoted himself to defending personal liberties and privacy through both technological and political direct action. At 21, he made headlines for organizing protests against government surveillance, as well as the imprisonment of hacker Dmitry Skylarov. PGP. Early in his career, Len distinguished himself as an authority in public key cryptography, the foundation of Bitcoin. By 22, he was presenting at conferences and had founded a public key crypto startup with famous open source activist Bruce Perens. After the startup collapsed in the wake of the dot-com bubble, Len joined Network Associates to help develop the PGP encryption central to Bitcoin. Working on the, PG on the release of PGP-7 in 2001, 
Lens set up interop testing for open PGP implementations, putting him in touch with many important crypto pioneers. Len also contributed to the GNU Privacy Guard implementation of OpenPGP and worked with PGP inventor Phil Zimmerman to invent a new cryptographic protocol. When introducing Bitcoin, Satoshi said he hoped Bitcoin would be the same thing for money that strong cryptography, i.e. PGP, was for securing files. A generation ago, multi-user time-sharing computer systems had a similar problem. Before strong encryptions, users had to rely on password protection. Then, strong encryption became available to the masses and trust was no longer required. It's time we had the same thing for money. Hal Finney At Network Associates, Len worked on PGP alongside Hal Finney. Finney was the second PGP developer and helped create the RFC 4880 standard for open PGP interoperability. He was also the earliest and most important contributor to Bitcoin after Satoshi. Finney was the first person other than Satoshi to contribute to Bitcoin's code and to run a Bitcoin node. Finney was the first recipient of Bitcoin sent from Satoshi himself. Finney invented the concept of reusable proof of work which Bitcoin's mining is based on. Satoshi corresponded with Finney extensively, even before Bitcoin's release. In one of their last posts, Satoshi publicly intimated their respect for Finney. Unsurprisingly, Finney is one of the most popular candidates for Satoshi, although he denied it even on his deathbed. For this to be true, Finney would have needed to fake his interactions with Satoshi and simultaneously created under both his real name and a separate fake identity. Finney would also continue to work on Bitcoin well after Satoshi had moved on in 2011. Remailers. Len and Finney shared one very rare and relevant skill set. They were both developers of the remailer technology that was a precursor to Bitcoin. Proposed by David Chom alongside cryptocurrency, remailers are specialized servers for sending information anonymous, anonymously or pseudo-anonymously. It was very common to use them when contributing to the cypherpunk mailing list, which itself was built on distributed remailers. While early remailers simply forwarded info while stripping away a sender's identity, later protocols like Mixmaster, the most popular remailer, relied on decentralized nodes to distribute fixed size blocks of encrypted info across a P2P network. Bitcoin's architecture is very similar to that of remailers, although its nodes transmit transaction data in the place of messages. In 1997, crypto anarchist founder Tim May even proposed a digital currency built on remailers. As a primary developer, node operator, and principal maintainer for Mixmaster, Len was an eminent expert in remailer technology. He also implemented similar technology as a systems engineer and security architect for the anonymizer privacy guard. Not only were remailers a direct technological progenitor of Bitcoin, they were fundamental to its intellectual history. In the essay, Why Remailers?, Finney argued that remailers were the foundation of an anonymous digital economy. Remailers represent the ground floor of this house of ideas, the ability to exchange messages privately without revealing our true identities. In this way, we can engage in transactions, show credentials, and make deals without government or corporate databases tracking our every move. One cypherpunk vision includes the ability to engage in transactions anonymously, using digital cash that would not be traceable to the participants. So this is another area where anonymous mail is important. Remail, uh, remailer operators were some of the first to recognize the need for cryptocurrency. Without a means for anonymous payments, remailers had to be run altruistically at their operator's expense. This introduced scalability issues and also meant that spam and abuse were a constant problem. Because of this, many concepts fundamental to cryptocurrency 
emerged from the need for an abuse-resistant for-profit remailer. In 1994, Finney proposed that remailers could be monetized by anonymous coins and cash tokens. Smart contracts were first discussed in the context of preventing remailer abuse. Nick Scabo's prescient 1997 paper on smart contracts specifically references Mixmaster. Ian Goldberg and Ryan Lackey, both of whom Len knew, were major figures in the remailer community who worked on unfinished cryptocurrency called Hind in 1998. Ian later created several early eCash clients, and Ryan went on to become the CSO of Tezos. Accordingly, Satoshi's second post about Bitcoin stated that pay-to-send email was Bitcoin's first working use case. Initially, it can be used in proof-of-work applications for services that could almost be free, but not quite. It can already be used for pay-to-send email. The send dialog is resizable, and you can enter as long as a message as you would like. Adam Back Crossing paths with Len in the small remailer community was Blockstream CEO Adam Back, the first person to communicate with Satoshi. Back's own interest in cryptocurrency started from running a remailer, and he created the Hashcash proof-of-work system for remailer operators to combat spam and DDoS attacks. Satoshi would later use Hashcash as the basis of Bitcoin's mining. We know that Len directly collaborated with Back, listing him as a contributor to a research paper as well as a Mixmaster memo. Both worked on numerous open PGP implementations and were connected in each other's PGP web of trust. Interestingly, Back himself has suggested that Satoshi might have been a remailer developer, noting that the devs would practice their own technology to pseudo anonymously contribute to cryptographic protocol discussions. Unlike many cypherpunks discussed, we know that Len made extensive pseudonymous contributions to the cypherpunk mailing list via remailers. At this point, it quotes a tweet, a tweet from Bram Cohen, uh, very recent. It says, it's a bit emotional for, emotional for me to talk about this, but I will say that Len posted pseudo-anonymously on the cypherpunks list constantly, including at least one fleshed out and long-lived handle, and even I didn't know what it was. He says also, also, I have a vague memory, mostly because Len told me about it and I wasn't paying close attention, that there was a NIM called Product Cipher, which pseudonymously posted the first ring signatures implementation to cypherpunks and then disappeared. Chom and Kosick. After high school, Len worked to support his family and never had the chance to attend college. In spite of this, in 2004, he secured his dream job, as a researcher and PhD candidate at COSIC, the Computer Security and Industrial Cryptography Research Group of KU Leuven in Belgium. Len's PhD advisor at COSIC was none other than the father of digital currency, David Chom. While Chom laid the groundwork for the entire cypherpunk movement and all cryptocurrencies, few could claim to have worked with him directly like Len did. A few of Chom's accomplishments. The inventor of cryptocurrency in his 1983 paper, Blind Signatures for Untraceable Payments. The invention of the blockchain with his 1982 dissertation, including code for all but one element of the blockchain detailed in the Bitcoin white paper. The creation of the first electronic cash system with his company, DigiCash. Anonymous payment between digital pseudonyms was central to this vision. Chom stands in the thick of a movement that seems unstoppable, the digitization of money. The wild card in the era of digital money is anonymity, and David Chom thinks we're in trouble without it. While DigiCash failed, partially due to a reliance on centralized systems, Chom wanted to create a second digital currency that would offer a combination of anonymity and practicality. While many saw its failure as proof that digital cash was infeasible, Satoshi defended the old Chamian currencies while acknowledging the issues caused by centralization. 
A lot of people automatically dismiss e-currency as a lost cause because of all the companies that failed since the 1990s. I hope it's obvious it was only the centrally controlled nature of those systems that doomed them. Lenz Research Lend worked at COSIC in Belgium until his death in 2011. In that time, he accumulated an impressive 45 publications and 20 conference committee positions. Lend's research was focused on developing privacy-enhancing protocols with real-world applicability and working code. His main project, aided by Bram Cohen, was the Pynchon Gate, an evolution of remailer technology that allowed for pseudo-anonymous information retrieval via a network of distributed nodes without a trusted third party. This work is very pertinent to Bitcoin. As work on the Pynchon Gate progressed, Len became increasingly focused on finding solutions for the Byzantine Fault, aka the Byzantine General's problem, that had been a major obstacle for earlier P2P networks. In the context of distributed computing, Byzantine fault tolerance refers to the ability of a network to remain functional even when nodes are compromised or unreliable. The Byzantine fault was one of the biggest problems that needed to be solved for a secure decentralized cryptocurrency without double spending or the need for trusted third parties. Satoshi's most important innovation was a triple entry accounting system that solved this using the blockchain introduced by Chom. During Bitcoin's development in 2008 to 2010, Len was increasingly active in financial cryptography. He joined the International Financial Cryptography Association and presented at the Financial Cryptography and Data Conferences, where he also held a committee seat. The latter was founded by Robert Hettinger, an early and prominent advocate for digital cash, which was a major topic at the conferences. Satoshi as academic. Numerous clues suggest that Satoshi was working in academia during Bitcoin's development, an idea embraced by Bitcoin Foundation founder Gavin Andreessen. I think he's an academic, maybe a postdoc, maybe a professor who just doesn't want the attention. Satoshi's code contributions and comments ramped up heavily during summer and winter break, but tapered off in the late spring and end of the year when an academic would have been taking or grading finals. The idiosyncratic construction of Bitcoin's code also suggests that Satoshi may have had an academic background. It has been described as brilliant but sloppy, eschewing conventional software development practices like unit testing, but exhibiting cutting-edge security architecture and an expert understanding of academic cryptography and e economics. Whoever did this had a deep understanding of cryptography. They've read the academic papers. They have a keen intelligence, and they're combining the concepts in a genuinely new way. When prominent security researcher Dan Kaminsky first reviewed Satoshi's code, he tried to pen test it with nine different exploits, but was amazed to find that Satoshi had already anticipated and patched out all of them. I came up with beautiful bugs, but every time I went after the code, there was a line that addressed the problem. I've never seen anything like it. This might suggest that Satoshi and Kaminsky had a shared set of InfoSec experiences and expertise. Coincidentally, Len and Kaminsky co-authored and presented a paper demonstrating methods for attacking public key infrastructure. Additionally, the Bitcoin white paper was released in a medium rarely seen on the cypherpunk mailing list, a latex formatted research paper with academic trappings such as an abstract, conclusion, and MLA citation. Compare this to other proposals like Bitgold and B-Money, which were unstructured blog posts. Satoshi in Europe. Since Kosik was based in Louvain, Len was living in Belgium during Bitcoin's development. This is salient given that a number of facts suggest that Satoshi was based in Europe, the primary focus of an early inquiry by the New Yorker. 
Satoshi's writing exhibits spelling and word choices idiosyncratic of British English, such as bloody difficult, flat, maths, gray with an E, as well as the DDMMYYYY date format. However, Satoshi also refers to euros rather than pounds. Bitcoin's Genesis block also included a headline from that day's copy of the Times newspaper, The Times 03 Jan 2000, 2009, Chancellor on the Brink of a Second Bailout for Banks. This headline was specific to the print version, which was only circulated in the UK and Europe. In 2009, The Times was a top 10 newspaper in Belgium and heavily used by scholars and researchers because of its widespread availability in libraries and its detailed index. These clues leave us with a paradox. They suggest Satoshi was European, yet someone with a requisite skill set and exposure to Bitcoin's primary influences would likely have been American. Much of the cypherpunk community coalesced conferences and meetups part of why a disproportionate number hailed from America and especially San Francisco. The jobs where one could have gained cutting edge professional infosuck and crypto experience were similarly concentrated in the US. Strangely enough, Len used the very same British English as Satoshi, even though he was an American. You see examples of him using the word flat, gray with an E, bloody and maths. Further corroborating the European hypothesis was the fact that analysis suggests Satoshi was a European night owl who worked on Bitcoin after returning from a job or school during the day. At one point, Satoshi stated that an increase in mining difficulty happened yesterday, which would not have been true if they lived in the US. Assuming Satoshi had a life outside Bitcoin, he did so during the working academic day when he was largely away from his computer at home. If Satoshi lived in a BST time zone, he worked mostly at night, often into the small hours. And when we examine Len's tweet history, we see that timestamps of Satoshi's codes and post commits correspond closely to Len's own hours of late night activity. P2P networking. While not the first cryptocurrency, Bitcoin was the first to be based on a fully P2P distributed network. The importance of this is emphasized in Satoshi's very first reference to Bitcoin. I've been working on a new electronic cash system that's fully peer-to-peer, -peer, with no trusted third party. In order to build Bitcoin, Dan Kaminsky stated that Satoshi would have needed to understand economics, cryptography, and P2P networking. And Len had an unusually early and intimate exposure to all three, along with their application to digital currency. While in San Francisco, Len lived with and collaborated with Bram Cohen, creator of the most widely used P2P protocol, BitTorrent. During this period, 2000, 2000 to 2002, Bram developed a P2P network called Mojo Nation, which used a digital currency of Mojo tokens, one of the first digital currencies to see a working public release. In Mojo Nation's P2P economy, tokens could be exchanged for the storage of files, which would be encrypted and encoded into blocks, uploaded into a distributed network of nodes hosting a public ledger, recalling Bitcoin's own system of distributed bilateral accounting. Mojo was not merely an internal accounting token, but a full currency. It could be exchanged for dollars and vice versa. Some of the first discussions of token economics concern the mechanics of Mojo tokens. A unit of Mojo represents a slice of the current capabilities of the system as a whole. If you perform work for me now, I give you credits. In the future, when the network is larger, those credits will represent a slice of a much larger pie and so will have increased in value when you spend them. Satoshi discusses token economics in a very similar way. It has the potential for a positive feedback loop. As users increase, the value goes up, 
which could attract more users to take advantage of the increasing value. While visionary, Mojo Nation's economy quickly collapsed due to hyperinflation. Satoshi, Satoshi consciously designed Bitcoin to avoid this fate by a built-in deflation and non-reliance on a central mint server. In 2001, Bram launched BitTorrent. As a P2P alternative to the centralized Napster, BitTorrent foreshadowed Bitcoin's own distributed node-based topology and system of consensus, as well as its protocol-level incentive system. BitTorrent innovated on networks like Nutella, not only at a technical level, but also by using economic incentives and game theory. Presciently, Len told Bram that BitTorrent would make him bigger than Napster founder Sean Fanning. Satoshi would later reference Napster when explaining the need for a fully decentralized network. Governments are good at cutting off the head of a centrally controlled network like Napster, but pure P2P networks like Nutella and Tor seem to be holding their own. Coincidentally, Len also collaborated with Tor founder Robble Dingledin, <laughs> Roger Dingledine. The two both worked on the Mix Minion Remailer Protocol co-presented at Black Hat and founded the Hot Pets Conference together. In 2002, Len and Bram co-founded a conference called CodeCon, which was focused on highly practical projects with working code. At CodeCon 2005, Finney introduced reusable proof of work via a modified BitTorrent client used to send P2P digital currency. One commenter described this as the world's first transparent server, which could facilitate a world of distributed cooperating RPAL uh, re reusable proof of work servers. Digital currency was a prominent subject at the first CodeCon, which included a demonstration involving Adam Back's Hashcash, as well as Zuko presenting Mnet, a fully open source and decentralized successor to Mojo Nation. Mojo wasn't tied to a single company and could be independently audited, both of which Satoshi considered critical. Mojo Nation co-founder Zuko Wilcox and Jim McCoy also proved to be inspirations for Bitcoin and cryptocurrency pioneers in their own right. When releasing Bitcoin 0.1 on Bitcoin.org, Satoshi included a link to Zuko's blog. Zuko would later to go on to found major privacy-focused privacy, privacy -focused cryptocurrency, Zcash. He created the oft-discussed Zuko's Triangle Framework. Zuko's Triangle is a trilemma of three properties that are generally considered desirable for names of participant in a network protocol, human meaningful, decentralized, and secure. McCoy is also a major influence within cryptocurrency and Ryan Selkis of Digital Currency Group has stated his belief that McCoy could be Satoshi. Hacktivism. Even by the standards of the cypherpunk community, Satoshi had especially strong ideological convictions and commitment to open knowledge that mirrored those of Len. I wish you wouldn't keep talking about me. Maybe instead make it about the open source project and give more credit to your dev contributors. Satoshi's hacktivist approach of distributing Bitcoin via a free open source grassroots project contrasts starkly with their predecessors. Chom, Stefan Brand, eCash, and others took a very different approach, filing patents, founding closed source venture backed companies, and attempting to drive adoption via corporate partnerships. This parallel lends own extensive contribution to open source projects like PGP, Mixmaster, GNU Privacy Guard, and others, as well as his extensive volunteer experience with groups like Shmoo Group. Satoshi alluded to their ideological leanings on a few occasions. They said Bitcoin was very attractive to the libertarian viewpoint and that it could win a major battle in the arms race and gain a new territory for freedom for several years. 
Len was similarly passionate about the need to defend open knowledge and technological advancement from corporate and governmental interference. The quest for knowledge is a fundamental part of being human. Any kind of prior restraint against that is, in my opinion, a violation of our freedom of thought and conscience. So, I am not, so not only am I hopeful that we can avoid overly restrictive knee-jerk legislation, I don't want to see anyone build a framework that could be misapplied for that purpose. Endings Just as Satoshi created Bitcoin from behind a pseudonym, Len was in a sense forced, forced to live behind a persona of his own. Following an incident in 2006, Len suffered from increasingly severe non-epileptic seizures and functional neurological problems which served to exacerbate the serious depression he had bought, battled since youth. As a victim of stigma, stigma, Len felt like he had to keep up this facade of being the same hyper-confident guy and was absolutely terrified that his declining health would bring an end to his work and disappoint the people he cared about. Despite these challenges, Len continued to work until months before his death, contributing to papers and even presenting at Darthmouth. Sadly, he was successful in concealing the severity of his situation from almost everyone in his life. There were very few people who had any idea just how far things had gone. The one refrain I heard over and over was, we never knew. It seemed like he was doing fine. Just as Len built on ideas that came before him, one gets the sense that he was devoted to building things that would outlast him, one reason he was committed to open source and open knowledge. This is our heritage, this research, these ideas that we have, that is leading to knowledge that no human in history has had the opportunity to have before. This is what we're going to be handing down to future generations. We need to make sure we are not backed into a corner where we are not able to distribute this research to others and that it isn't locked up in IP lawyer vaults. Len's death in 2011 represented a huge loss for the cypherpunk and the tech communities at large, a fact reflected in the huge outpouring of memories and sympathies that followed in its wake. Among all of this, there's one comment that still stands out to the author, a Hacker News comment from Pablo's 08. I became friends with Len when we were co-conspirator cypherpunks at a time when that was a wild frontier. We were reimagining our world, riddled with crypto systems that would mathematically enforce the freedoms that we treasured, anonymous remailers to preserve speech without fear of retribution, onion routers to ensure nobody could censor the internet, digital cash to enable a radically free economy. We have schemes to decentralize and distribute everything. We imagine complex and esoteric threats to problems we might someday have. We architect futuristic protocols to insulate against those threats. All this is a highly academic geek, geek utopia exercise. I intend to keep it that way, but Len wanted to get his hands dirty. Cypherpunks write code. A very interesting article by Leung on Medium. Len Sassaman and Satoshi, a cypherpunk history. Went a little long there. Sorry about that. Didn't think that article was so long, but then it was so fascinating. I just had to keep reading. And I thought, you know, if you're, if you're hanging with me, you're fascinated as well. Maybe this guy's Satoshi, right? I mean, he certainly has a, like the, the tweet, unfortunately I didn't have the tweet, but the tweet said something like it's a, it gives you goosebumps, right? That this article gives you goosebumps. He's right there in the blockchain he is on every node. I feel like I should make a book of street art. I found a couple more uh, collection snaps that I got in uh, Florence. Oh, and it's up to 54% yes. 
Forty-five percent. No, I gotta say, at first, uh, this this poll was very negative towards my book of street art. So I'm glad that it's come around. I'll try to gather those up. I have a lot, and I, I think they're super interesting. And they were all shot outside, so copyright's not really an issue, theoretically. And finally, a tweet from Niraj at Niraj KA. Real conversation I've had. Bro, why didn't you tell us to buy Bitcoin? I did. And you thought I was insane. Yeah, but why didn't you tell us harder? The price of Bitcoin is down. 3.8% in the last 24 hours, with a last of 49,394, a high of 51,777, and a low of 48,599. That's $1 for 2,022 Satoshis. Volume was at 7,770 Bitcoins changing hands. The market continues to lean long, with 92% of the market heading that direction. Bitcoin dominance is at 80%. Stay tuned to the World Crypto Network. We've got another interview coming up in about 45 minutes with the Crypto Alliance. We're actually going to be talking about some of the concepts that were discussed in the long article I just read about Len Sassaman. Uh, some of that stuff is going to be perfect. We're going to talk about the IP problems and the way that Bitcoin was designed open source and free compared to the way some of the other things were designed. So I really think that's going to come all together here. It's going to make perfect sense uh, in about 45 minutes. So stay tuned to the World Crypto Network. Please subscribe down below. We're up to 72% of the people watching this who subscribe. So that means 28% of you don't. So push that subscribe button. It's free. You don't even have to click notifications. Just click subscribe for now. And if you're watching on another platform, be sure to give us a thumbs up or a like or a favorite or a share or whatever they do there. And then maybe head over to YouTube and subscribe anyway, just because it's YouTube, right? It's, it's a place where people subscribe. So thanks so much for joining us. Until next time, bye bye. An infinite amount of cash at the Federal Reserve. There is an infinite amount of cash at the Federal Reserve. There is an infinite amount of cash at the Federal Reserve. <laughs>